happy to have back with us a guest who has been with us on a number of occasions in the past and whose presence on Dreamland is getting more important every day for a particular reason. That is because Barbara Hand Clow has profound understanding of what is actually happening to our planet, where it is, and what to expect in the future. Barbara's been on us with us on Dreamland in uh, 2005, discussing the Pleiadian agenda. In 2007, she was here to discuss time acceleration. Prior to the existence of our current archive, she discussed what I regard as one of the most important books written in modern times, Catastrophobia. Uh, we, she published in 2001, and we're going to begin today by discussing a little bit about that book, about why it is so important, and about what it all means. Uh, Barbara's website is handcloud2012.com. Uh, she does workshops, and there are any number of ways of coming into connect, connection with herself and her partner, Jerry Clow. Uh, they have taught thousands of students worldwide how to navigate in a very special way. There are nine dimensions that we can navigate, and Barbara and I are going to be talking about those over the course of this interview. We need insight into understanding what is happening to us now. For example, we're going to be talking about the oil spill in a whole new Way. Welcome to the show, Barbara Hand Clow. Hi, Whitley. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And Barbara, before we take another step, I would like to return, if you don't mind, to catastrophobia because I thought it was so important. Could you tell us exactly? Well, first, I would like to say that when this book was written in 2001, there was a smattering of information in the media and in the scientific press that there might have been a great catastrophe in uh, 11,500 years ago. Now, many years after the book has been written, Richard Firestone, Alan West, and Simon Warwick Smith have taken this into uh, a, a scientifically accepted reality. But Barbara Han Clow knew all about it long before then. Barbara, uh, could you tell us now what a, what catastrophobia is about? Yeah, the reason that I wrote catastrophobia is by the time 2000 rolled around, um, I'd been teaching for about 20 years at that point, and I of course teach higher consciousness techniques. And I, as I, the longer I taught, the more I was asking the same fundamental question, which is basically, what's wrong with us as a species? In other words, as I was teaching people, I could see what their potential was, and yet I could see that they were afflicted by severe blocks that were very difficult to break through. And so I went back to the original wisdom of my Cherokee grandfather, who was my teacher from age 3 to um, 17 when he died. And um, he always talked about this great cataclysm, and of course it exists in all of the ancient records of all of the, um, the old people. Um, the fall of Atlantis is how we know about it in Greek background. And so my grandfather said that during my time, um, which of course is going on now, um, that the human race would have to wake up and remember what happened um, 11,500 years ago, which is this great cataclysm. And since writing Catastrophobia, I've modified the dates slightly in that it looks to me like this cataclysm actually stretched from about 14,000 B.C. to 9,500 B.C. But the big whammy, the big destructive force was definitely 9,500 B.C. That date is very, very correct. Um, what happened was fragments from the veil of supernova um, came into our solar system and wreaked havoc throughout our solar system for approximately three to 4,000 years, but most strongly 9500 BC. So to go back to my own research, I wrote the book with a couple of Oxford scientists because I'm not a scientist myself. I'm a consciousness researcher. And my issue with these cataclysms is what have they done to human consciousness? And the thesis, the basic thesis of catastrophe 
catastrophobia is that we went through this monumental destructive event um, 11,500 years ago and that we are currently a multi-traumatized species. In other words, we've been a multi-traumatized species for about 11,500 years, but we don't have any way of getting in touch. It would be like a person who was abused as a very small child, sexually abused or physically abused, but the person has no memory of the event, and so consequently they can't go after the originating problem, if you see what I mean. So that was the thesis of catastrophobia, and then of course I've gone on since then. I've taken that thesis, of course, and woven it into subsequent books and looking at it constantly from a different point of view. Yes, and you know, one of the most interesting things in Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, which is, by the way, a fascinating work we're going to be discussing over the course of this interview, is a mention in, uh, uh, on page uh, 101 of another planet quite similar to Earth in a nearby galaxy that hasn't mm -hmm. undergone such a catastrophe. And you discuss the difference between these two worlds. If you could illuminate us a little bit about Ion and how yeah. you came to know about Ion and what, what this means in terms of our own future. Mm -hmm. Does that resonate with you, Whitley? Yes. The idea? Yeah, because usually you, you and I are somehow in connection with the same sources of information often. Um, that was purely channeled information, and as you know from my record, I don't channel very often, and I tend to test it to, to the nth degree <laughs> because I don't trust it. I would rather get my information straight on when I'm fully conscious. But what, what I channeled back in, in 1995, um, which is in the Pleiadian agenda, is that there is another galaxy, a twin galaxy, to the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy, of course, is our galaxy. And our twin galaxy is Andromeda, which makes sense astronomically because Andromeda and the Milky Way galaxy are quite close, and they're also moving toward each other and merging. So, so all of this makes sense astronomically. But the channel part of it was that there is a planet in the Andromeda galaxy that's in a solar system very similar to our solar system. In other words, that planet is approximately the same distance uh, from its star, its sun. And that that planet um, has had a very similar history to Earth in terms of evolution in the galaxy, but that they did not suffer a cataclysm 11,500 years ago. And so that where does this channel information come from? Well, when I do channel, I channel from the Pleiades star system. And the beings who bring the information are the Pleiadians. And so the Pleiadians said that um, Ion has a, 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 like a vibrational resonance with us, our planet, and that Ion is holding a vibrational resonance of perfect form to the Earth so that as the Earth moves through processing the uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome that we're suffering from this cataclysm, that as we move back into resonance with who we really are, that this twin planet Ion is our guide. And it's very interesting because this does come up in Gnostic literature. And in this case, they talk about Ion, they spell it A-E-O-N, where the um, Pleiadian say that the planet in Andromeda Galaxy is, is I-O-N. And according to the Gnostic literature, the ion is some sort of factor in our um, in our reality, which is pull. It's like an attractor pulling us th through to a, a state of higher consciousness. So there is some verification for this, I think, in um, Gnostic literature. Well, I brought it up because it resonates with me too. As soon as I read about it, I. I could feel its presence, and I don't channel at all. I'm just mm -hmm. yeah. awful. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't well, even I don't consider like it. it. <laughs> no, because it, it's so it's so amorphous. You can't tell what's going on. Is yes. it your imagination yes. or not? You don't know. But this, there's something in this some, somewhere. If it's not in the Andromeda galaxy and it's not called Ion, fine. But it is. It is, and it is mm -hmm. somewhere, and there is a relationship between us and this place, I think. Now, and here's where, my, here's where my thinking has gone since then, because, you know, it keeps on evolving. 
And I discovered Carl Kalamann's research, the Swedish biologist who has an, an evolutionary theory of the Mayan calendar. Um, and then my uh, 2007 book, The Mayan Code, um, is a book in which I wrote about Kalamann's work. So I've become um, very deeply involved in Kalamann's theory. And Kalamann is saying that there is, there is this force which is drawing us um, through evolution to, to an apex, to an apotheosis point. And in his case, he calls it the world tree, which, of course, resonates like crazy because the world tree is a phenomenon that's reported by all cultures on this planet, and I really resonate with it. But I think that this ion force is somehow related to that evolutionary attractor that Kalamon's talking about. I think there's a connection there. Well, I think so, too. And uh, I let me... Let me um, let me go now. Move on into another area, slightly different, and that is one of the centerpieces of your thought is the idea of the photon and photon energy. And I think it's important that listeners understand exactly first what how you define the photon and what photon energy is, and then we'll go on in uh, in the next segment to talk about what exactly it is doing and what kind of changes we can expect in relation to it. Right now, we're going to take a little break. This is Whitley Strieber talking to Barbara Hanclow, her website, hancloud2012.com. There are many, many interesting books. Uh, the revised and expanded Alchemy of Nine Dimensions is in my hands right now, and you'll find over the course of this uh, interview quite a few reasons for reading her work and getting involved in her and Jerry Clow's workshops. You can actually come face-to-face -face with Barbara. She doesn't hide. It's worth doing. We'll be right back. We're talking to Barbara Hand Clow, her website, handcloud2012.com. Before we left the air, Barbara, we were talking about, beginning to talk about photons and photon energy. And why don't you tell us exactly what it is you mean when you say okay. photon? Well, this is one of the most difficult subjects because that material is totally channeled. Um, in the Pleiadian agenda again. And what the Pleiadians said um, was that in 1995 that we were entering into um, this band of light called a photon belt, is what they called it. Several other people who channel also have said the same thing. And that we are going deeper and deeper into this band of light and that the energy frequencies in this band of light would transmute us. So that's all I have from a channel point of view. And then, of course, I've taken off from it um, in my own re conscious research and first of all, there is a lot of evidence at this point scientifically. Um, I don't have any of this in front of me right now, but there are lots of reports at this point that we are moving into an area of the um, galaxy where there's going to be a, a great change in the quality of the um, elements that are going to be affecting us. Um, and I, unfortunately, I don't have those any references because I wasn't expecting you to ask me about it. <laughs> but, you know, but that's okay. Um, the scientific stuff, I really like to have the name and you know what I mean. Yeah, but well, we Regarding my just... own work as a teacher, um, I would say that my issue as a teacher has evolved into teaching people about how to access nine dimensions of consciousness, which is, of course, what Alchemy of Nine Dimensions is about. But Alchemy of Nine Dimensions that you have in front of you comes from the Pleiadian agenda, and it's my scientific analysis of what on earth those Pleiadians were saying. In other words, I've done a scientific analysis of my own channel book, which I think is unprecedented. And so regarding my own thoughts on this after teaching this material for 15 years, I actually think what we're talking about is an expansion of our access on the electromagnetic spectrum. As most of your listeners know, we only um, can basically access the visible light spectrum. But I think this energy that we're moving into in the galaxy is going to be opening up our lenses of consciousness, like in the infrared zones and all these different areas of the spectrum. And I think it's that it's that opening that will um, create the opening of nine dimensions of consciousness. So the photon band for me is really about um, moving into light, which is awakening us to these higher levels. What interests me about this so very much is that it, the way in which 
it corresponds with an interview we did here on Dreamland just recently with David Sereda. Uh, and David was talking about the fact, and this is in fact true, that the, the, the Earth, the Sun, and our solar system are moving above the plane of the galaxy and thus uh, the dust around us and between us and the galactic center, the levels of dust are dropping. And for that reason, more energy is coming our way uh, from the galactic center. We're, we're more directly uh, being affected by, by energies that uh, previously had been, had been muffled by the, the dust. And so the result is the sun is becoming more active and Earth is becoming more directly exposed to cosmic ray events. And if you look in the scientific press, you'll find that the cosmic ray count is rising dramatically on Earth and has been for some time. This isn't something that's going to happen in two days. It's been happening for a couple of thousand years. But we're, we're reaching a point on the curve where it, it, the decline in the dust becomes much more abrupt now, he's saying that there's a cycle where the planet goes the, uh, up and down a, a, around this lens. But what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting is that you're picking up on the energies that are going to be coming that we can actually use. And that this is, a, that, 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 that you're talking about ener the same thing he's talking about, only with him I just touched on this. We touched, talked about the dangerous energies. I think we can talk about today about the positive, useful energies. Mm -hmm. And right. so, and, go ahead. Yeah, and that that acceleration that he's speaking of for a couple of thousand years has been intensifying very rapidly since 1998-99. So we've been in a major um, curve of awakening of this level of consciousness. And I think probably most listeners, um, um, if you go back to 1998-1999, you can detect a, a, a very, very noticeable speed up, which is actually being caused by gamma rays and cosmic rays um, penetrating the surface of our planet. And, and so the question would be, how do you use it? You know, that's really been my wor life's work is, is I believe this is happening. I believe it's coming. And I think the only question is um, how people are going to respond to it. And so that's where in Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, especially the new edition, I really went after the um, forces in our reality that I call the forces of the collective mind um, and how the collective consciousness of the human race is changing at this point. And I think Alchemy of Nine Dimensions just has some great... I, I'm a real practical type person. I go like, okay, this is a great idea, but what are we going to do with it? And the model in um, Alchemy of Nine Dimensions for handling the forces of dark and light and the forces of positive and negative energy in the collective is actually the key to the um, gamma ray and cosmic ray issue. And then the question is, why is it the key? Well, if we go back to catastrophobia and we assume that we're a multi-traumatized species that's waking up, then all of us are going through what I call a wounded healer awakening, where we're awakening the deepest levels of the wounding within our consciousness in order to go to another level. And that's where the oil spill comes in. We are really getting an awakening, speaking of being a multi-traumatized species. Now we have it in our face every day that we pierce the mother and the mother is polluting the um, seas and oceans on our planet. The oil spill is as if we have cut an artery in Mother Earth and she is bleeding out, as it were, like somebody bleeding out into their own brain. And... Stopping this and fixing this and repairing this is going to take an immense amount of human effort, a lot more than I think anyone has yet told us. And that the, in fact, this is going to be a catastrophe that we'll be living even with our grandchildren. Uh, we, and yet you, you don't speak of a, an apocalyptic event in 2012. You see this as an awakening event. Could you tell us exactly how the oil spill fits into your thinking, for example? Yeah, well, one of the reasons that I could see the scope of the oil spill was because of the time acceleration theory. 
And so going back to the material we talked about um, a couple of years ago regarding the Mayan code, the Mayan code, time acceleration and awakening the world mind, is based on Carl Kalamann's research. And where Carl and I came together as colleagues is that in my nine-dimensional system, as of 2004, when I first published Alchemy, I had a clear definition of the first eight dimensions. And then mysteriously, now remember, this is channeled material, again, going back to 1995. And the Pleiadians were saying that the ninth dimension was time. And they were saying that time is actually a higher dimension, which is actually influencing divine consciousness, which is a totally outrageous idea. But when I discovered Kalaman's research, um, I realized that his definition of the Mayan um, calendar as an evolutionary force in our consciousness is the definition for the ninth dimension. So then at that point, I wrote about his work because his work explains my work. Okay, so getting into Kalaman's theory is very complicated because it involves nine underworlds of consciousness. It goes back 16.4 billion years and all kinds of stuff like that. But what's relevant to us right now is that we are resonating um, in, in different moments in time with points in the past that have a great deal of influence on our consciousness. And so based on Carl Kalamann's theory, as of early May, we entered into, um, into like total resonation with 9500 BC. So since I'm the author of Catastrophobia and had gotten so deeply into how that affected our consciousness, I was waiting in late April, early May, to see what would be created in our reality which would cause us to resonate with the 9500 BC cataclysm. So when the oil spill occurred, I immediately knew that, and then also if you go back a couple of months, remember all the earthquakes, the planet was actually yeah. like jealous starting in January. This, this whole period, to tell you the truth, from November 2009 through November 2010 is in resonance with that cataclysmic period. But I was looking for that bingo point because I already knew that that was the really big one. So then when the oil spill occurred, I realized that it is the big cataclysm. And then I became really amazed by something else that's in, that's in um, Alchemy of Nine Dimensions. In Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, in the second chapter, which is the chapter on the second dimension. Now, the second dimension is the realm of energy on our planet between the iron core crystal and the crust of the planet. Like the first dimension is the iron core crystal in the center, and then the second dimension is that whole realm of, of, of energy um, below the crust, which, of course, includes um, penetrating the crust under the oceans in order to um, access oil. So in Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, I discussed the abiotic oil theory, which this, is, this comes from Thomas Gold, who was, who was Fred Hoyle's um, colleague for 50 years. And Thomas Gold um, uh, uh, came up with the theory that oil is a renewable resource, which has since been verified. So what I'm getting at, Whitley, is one of the things we've got to realize right now it is that if the abiotic oil theory is accurate, and what the abiotic oil theory says is that oil is coming from an area of our planet below the crust where oil is being continually produced. It's not a matter of pockets of um, oil going back millions and millions of years. It's being continually produced. Now, this has been proven scientifically by one of the greatest scientists in our time, Thomas Gold, but it's being kept a secret. And the reason that it's been a secret is because you can manipulate people if they think that oil is non-renewable. So people have been willing to put up with high prices, and they've been willing to put up with um, oil derricks that are obviously extremely dangerous for our, for our ecology. And we've got to start realizing that the whole thing around oil is a great big lie, and people have got got to figure this out. This is part of the awakening process, is to get the right story instead of the constant lies that we get from government and science. But we do. We get nothing but lies. And yeah. we're, going, we're going to talk when we come back about just what those lies may mean in this case. We'll be right back.
We're talking to Barbara Handcloud today, Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, Catastrophobia, so many other books, extraordinary workshops. She and her husband, her, her partner, I should say, Jerry, do. Uh, go to her website, handcloud2012.com, and get involved in this unique and powerful exploration of the limits and beyond the limits of human consciousness. When we left the air, we were talking about the oil spill and the possibility, which I think is almost certainly true, that oil is actually a renewable resource, that it, it, that it isn't uh, made up of the, of the fossils of billions of little plants from the distant past, but it's a very different substance. If this is true, Barbara, then what happens in the Gulf? Because it, it would seem perhaps that we can't stop it. That's right. What we have done, Whitley, this is the thing that we've got to understand. We have pierced the layer of the planet where oil is being produced. It's not about some pocket that got stuck down there during the Pleistocene era or something like that. Remember the rotting dinosaur theory? Supposedly the way oil came, occurs on our planet is that a whole bunch of dinosaurs fell into pits with a bunch of trees and everything rotted and it produced oil. Do you remember that one? Yes. That's a complete fiction. And, and the facts are that the oil production is a, is a chemical um, production that goes into the organic level um, below the crust of the planet. And now, now this is supposition on my part. Um, when the abiotic oil theory um, was, was crafted by Thomas Gold in the 1970s, the Russians immediately started drilling down to that layer. And as of around the mid-90s, the Russians had around three or 400 um, oil drills that go all the way down to that layer on land. Then, meanwhile, people started drilling um, from derricks in the ocean. And this is a supposition on my part, but I think the reason people want to do offshore drilling is it's cheaper and easier to put the pipe down through the water and then go into the crust than it is to do it on land. But as we can see, if there's an oil um, disaster on land, it can be capped and dealt with. It's happened many, many, many times. But it would appear that the pressure from this layer, um, this abiotic layer down there below the crust of the um, ocean bottom, it would appear that the pressure is so intense and also the water pressure um, a mile down. You see what I'm getting at? In other words, we have pierced yes. the actual, it's like a river, it's like a river of, of um, oil um, uh, underneath the, the crust of our planet. And if that's true, we, you know, we need to get the science straight here, for God's sakes. I mean, I'm sure that everybody has been shocked by the lack of, of intelligence on the part of the British, British petroleum scientists. It's like, what are we doing? Yeah, what, exactly. What are we doing? Are, is it some kind of a death wish that we're not directly in touch with? It's very frightening. It relates, in a way, to the amnesia of catastrophobia, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And then here, here's where it starts to get really interesting because alchemy of nine dimensions, the, the nine-dimensional system is a very, very alive and organic and creative um, system. And I, I don't mind saying that because I didn't invent it. It came through me, you know, from the Pleiadians. And one of the things the Pleiadians say about the second dimension, the, the area below the crust, is that it creates us. In other words, um, science has typically had this idea that there was a primordial soup on the surface of the planet, and then um, comets flew by or organic material somehow got into that primordial soup, and that's how life began. But the Pleiadians are saying that life actually comes from the second dimension and creates us in the third dimension. So what we're dealing with right now is we're dealing with the issue of starting to understand our resonation with the actual real forces of the planet. Be because another issue about the second dimension is that um, one of the things that's the most interesting about human beings is that for thousands and thousands of years as a species, we used to resonate with the planet in a geomantic way. We had sacred sites all over the planet and we were in touch with vortexes and ley lines and all these systems on the planet. To the and extent that, you know, our sacred sites are all aligned in ancient right. sacred, all over the planet. We yeah, knew something. We, we, were, we were somebody else then. 
Yeah, and the ancient teaching was that by resonating with the sacred sight system of the planet, then we would then understand that Gaia is alive, and then it's possible to have a deep earth ecology, which would mean that humans would be assisting the planetary processes instead of destroying them. And so, as you can see, this oil spill is just a wake-up call at, at that very deep, deep level of, of the actual sacredness of our planet. And if you watch people, it, it's affecting them that way. It's, it is getting people to wake up. Well, I hope it's getting people to wake up because it seems almost as if, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of spiritually giving ourselves a choice that if we don't wake up, we would rather die. Yes, that's right. Because, you know, if folks, I, I, I mean, I know they don't tell you anything about this in the media, but in fact, if that oil spill cannot be contained, it will cause us the, the, the destruction of our world as we know it. Uh, that's and right. A profound yeah. destruction and a destruction that will take not just a few years, but hundreds of thousands of years to. So if I may, let me bring up alchemy. <laughs> Because alchemy, as you well know, is the issue of whether it's possible for us to transmute um, our, our, our reality, our elements from one thing to another. Now, if we throw the Mayan calendar in here, um, what Carl Kalamon is saying is that we're coming to the end of 16.4 billion years, if you can imagine that, of evolutionary um, growth. And in 2011, which is only one year from now, we're going into the apex of that evolutionary level. And so the question, Whitley, would, would have something to do, I mean, I'll put this together as, as best I can because it's kind of subtle. But the question would be, what do we transmute into if we become truly aware of the, the, the life force of the planet and of the powers of the planet? In other words, I believe that our planet can, can regenerate and restructure itself in a way that's possible for life to continue. But it would appear to me that the big test is humans are not going to continue unless they wake up. Do you see what I mean? That's the alchemy. The well, exactly. Is, um, we won't. Yeah. We, we, yeah. we will have been a failed species. And in this, you know something fascinating about this universe? It's so large that if even one one millionth of one percent of all of the planets on it, in it, have life. That means that there are over a trillion planets that not only have life, but conscious life in the universe. Right. And at those kinds of numbers, you can be sure that planets with conscious life on them are going extinct every few minutes. That many. And many more are reaching consciousness. Many are breaking through into new levels, but it, it, it's it's not impossible. It could happen, and it, it's very scary. Right, and that's why I, I had the audacity, if you ask me, to title one of my books an alchemy, because the question is, can we transmute? And this is the, the, the incredible thing about this moment in time is the issue of that transmutation starts in March of 2011 and finishes itself October 28, 2011. Now, that's according to Kalaman. Right. But speak Kalaman, I'm, I, I first and foremost am an astrologer. So when I discovered Kalaman's theory, I started testing it. I started testing it on every possible astrological level that I know of, as well as I tested him to see if what he said was going to happen at a certain point in time was going to happen. And I've been testing it for five years, and it's airtight. So I've entered into the zone. Basically, Whitley, what I'm saying is I'm realizing that during 2011, we are going to go into an alchemical relationship with our planet. We're well, going isn't to that already happening? Because aren't, aren't we doing that with this oil spill? It's not a pretty relationship, but it's very alchemical. Well, it's certainly getting people to tune into the second dimension, and that's really yeah. the key, because the, those forces in the second dimension are the forces that actually create life itself and, and create the possibility of um, health and balance on, on the surface, as people will see as the oceans die. We're going to take a little break, 
And we're going to come back and we're going to get into more detail about this potential process of transmutation because Barbara's laid it out brilliantly in Alchemy of Nine Dimensions. We'll be right back. I'm talking to Barbara Hancloud today, her website, hancloud2012.com. We've been moving up into the point of talking about the book, Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, the 2011 and 2012 Prophecies and Nine Dimensions of Consciousness. We're going to end up in a situation, and are in fact ending up in a situation, where we have choices to make, and the choices are huge because they have to do with the continuance of the human species in some coherent form. Why don't you tell us a little bit, Barbara, if you will, about the nine dimensions and how they do relate to human consciousness and how we can begin to open ourselves to these energies. Okay, well, let's first let's define the dimensions, and then we'll look at um, how they actually affect us as a species. Um, so according to the Pleiadians, um, there are nine dimensions of consciousness which our species is capable of accessing. And then they also said that we would access um, these levels by the end of the uh, mind calendar, um, which is not it wasn't very interesting back in 95, but it's getting to be interesting at this moment. And so the first dimension is the iron core crystal in the center of our planet. And then the second dimension is the telluric elemental realm between the crystal and the crust, which we've been discussing. Then the third dimension is the surface of the planet, linear space and time, and everybody's familiar with that, and those three dimensions are solid. Then when we go into the fourth dimension and higher, we're entering into dimensions that have increasingly high frequencies and are less solid. The fourth dimension is the um, collective consciousness of all of the thoughts and feelings of all of the humans who have ever existed on the planet. So the fourth dimension is filled up with all kinds of thoughts and ideas and feelings that connect all of us. And it's the most difficult dimension for most of us to deal with. And if you think about it, that dimension isn't solid, it isn't physical, but you can feel it. It's extremely palpable. Then, as soon as we've resolved the conflict... Well, wait, Barbara, just, just, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but how can no we problem. feel it? How does that work? Um, because if you think about it, you're tuned in right now mentally and, and emotionally to everybody, other, every other being on the planet. That, that dimension is what connects us. It's what creates the media, for example. But unfortunately, the media is used as a tool um, to control and manipulate instead of as a tool for information. This dimension can be bad or good depending on how people handle it, like a lot of other things. Okay, should, so should I go on? Yeah, please do. To the fifth, that yeah, okay. that so did a point, nice job. Okay, so when we move into the fifth dimension, we're moving into the heart and unconditional love. And that happens for us when we resolve our problems in the fourth dimension, because the fourth dimension has all to do about dark and light and judgment and our beliefs about other people and power and control and so on and so forth. But if we can resolve th that issue, which is what we do in healing sessions and therapy, then we move into the open heart. And most listeners are, are familiar, if they either experienced the open heart, unconditional love, or at least they know what it is. Then when we start going into the sixth dimension, it starts getting really subtle because the sixth dimension is sacred geometry and it's the realm of forms that replicate here. It's a whole geometrical zone of reality that creates reality in our dimension. And the sixth dimension is really a lot of fun because, for example, um, there's an ideal um, Whitley in the sixth dimension. And if Whitley in the third dimension where you live, if you just align with your ideal self, then you tend to stay in very good physical, mental, and emotional um, health. And all of us have an ideal you in the sixth dimension, which is one of the reasons it's a good idea to do yoga and sacred dance and different, different things that align us with the sixth dimension. Then the seventh dimension is the realm of sound, the realm of the music of the spheres. And then the eighth dimension is, is divine consciousness. You can call it God, goddess if you want to, oneness or whatever you want to call it. And the easiest way to understand these other dimensions, upper dimensions, is to go in reverse. 
So the divine mind, just like in the Bible, um, it w- comes the word. The next thing that happens is the word or sound, and then the sound creates the world by means of the geometry. And we can see that. Like when you look at sunflowers and you look at shells and you look at all the geometrical forms on the planet, and then scientifically speaking, um, there's lots of ways of proving that sound creates geometry. There's even devices for doing that. So those are the eight dimensions. And as I said, I didn't understand the ninth dimension until 2004 or 2005 when I ran into Carl Kalamann's research. The reason that I've written a revised edition of Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, because what you have in front of you is you have a, a 2010 edition of the 2004 book. But what I changed in it, number one, was I I explained the ninth dimension um, correctly as being the Mayan calendar and the timing of the Mayan calendar. And then the other thing that happened in this new edition of Alchemy is back in 2004 when I wrote it, I personally did not have the fourth dimension to a level of clarity yet. I mean, I think our whole life is a struggle um, with the fourth dimension moving beyond dark and light and moving beyond um, judgment and control. So at this point, um, I have gotten there myself, and so then I was able to clarify the fourth dimension. And this was very exciting um, for me. It's interesting, alchemy of nine dimensions is just selling like hotcakes. And it's just interesting. It didn't sell very well in 2004. And I think it's because it has moved to a level of a true alchemy. That fourth dimension really had to be clarified in order for the reader to start to straighten out the issues in the fourth dimension. So those are the nine dimensions. Well, we, I can... we should be, the fourth dimension now should be precipitating onto our reality. Isn't that correct? Well, the fourth dimension has become, because of media and technology and all that, the fourth dimension is really tricky these days because of the effect yeah. of media on us. So and I couldn't understand one word. You're, you're fading in and out a little bit, so I might have missed a cue it's there. It's odd that I'm on fading in and out because the, 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 uh, the show is recording beautifully. There's no sign of any fading in and out at all. Uh, it must well, be something another, between the two of us on the, on the uh, phone lines. But let's yeah, go ahead hope, anyway. I, what I was well, trying... you know what I'd like to go ahead. Yeah, what I'd like to say, Whitley, is that um, a lot of people talk about these days are talking about ascending into the fourth dimension. You've, you've heard some of that stuff, um, yeah. and out of out of the third dimension. And I don't look at it that way at all. I'm an indigenous person, and the essence of reality is to live fully in our dimension. So if we're ascending into anything, I think it's hopefully ascending into the heart and ascending into unconditional love. So to get there, we've got that, that struggle that each one of us deals with at the collective level. So let me now, let's, we're coming on, surprisingly enough, to the end of our time together. Let me ask you, you say that uh, elsewhere that in, by 2012, we will be fully the, in in the photon belt all the time. What does that mean? What will it be like? Well, that's where I've had to put together, you know, channel stuff and stuff I'm experiencing. And as I said earlier, I think that the photon band is opening up that 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 spectrum on the visible light spectrum, opening us into infrared and opening us into those other levels. And I think that the widening of our perceptual abilities on on the spectrum is what is making it possible for us to start being in touch with these nine these nine levels of consciousness. And I'd like to say that I'm not the only one. Um, for example, speaking of crop circles, um, Crop circles have caused people to go on a, um, a journey with sacred geometry, and sacred geometry is very complicated, um, you know, tetrahedral geometry and, and Fibonacci spirals and all that stuff. But there is a, actually a massive awakening going on with these nine dimensions. And if you watch, for instance, another thing that's very popular right now is sound technology for healing. Yes. Because if you sound technology, then you can awaken people's natural geometry, then the heart opens, and then they have the energy to resolve the, those fourth dimensional conflicts. And those fourth dimensional conflicts are what keep us from being fully present in 3D, 
This is one of the reasons I don't like a lot of New Age ideas about ascension and trying to go up because I'm trying to stay right here in 3D in linear space and time, get in touch with the second and first dimension, first dimension um, in, in a vibrational way. And then once I'm grounded in that way, that's when I start trying to go to these higher levels. It's almost like my thinking is in reverse of a lot of what you hear in the New Age. So, but you can change in the sense that you can become open to these other levels. You can you can make yourself able to uh, participate in these energies. Mm-hmm. So and that can, I mean, of course, that's that's what Jerry and I teach. We actually teach right. people how to do it. But I have to tell you, everybody is waking up at these levels because I'm just watching them. I, every day now, I see more evidence of that people are picking up these other levels. I mean. Who would have ever imagined that millions of fairly ordinary people would study sacred geometry 20 years ago when I go back to the early crop circle movement? Well, exactly. That stuff, that stuff is tough, you know. And, Very. And, and now you know, millions are following the crop circles and millions of people are interpreting them. And, and in order to interpret them, you have to learn some fairly advanced um, geometrical uh, science. And so we actually are waking up. It's just that um, you know, it's kind of hard to see it sometimes. Well, someone is challenging us. The crop circles create such a such an extraordinary question in the human mind. And you know, my wife has done research into what what unanswerable questions do to the mind. And it's amazing that they actually change the brain. They actually make the brain stronger. So the yeah. crop circles are changing our brains. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. And, you know, during the last election, um, some interesting stuff came out about conservatives um, versus liberals in the United States or fundamentalists versus liberals or whatever you want to call it. And some interesting brain work was done where it showed that people just simply are wired to think one way or the other. And no matter what you say to them, they're always going to hear the same thing. Do you know what I mean? Yes, and I remember it, that research. We reported on it on yeah, London you know, Country. Yeah, you know about that. And, and so it would seem to me that the only thing that's going to pull people out of being stuck that way, and that, that I would say, is a fourth-dimensional um, hard drive lock on your brain when, when you're stuck in a fundamentalist mode or you're stuck in whatever you're stuck in. And so I think these, the opening of these higher dimensions are just simply pulling us out of, 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 of a place where we've been locked in and stuck. And now that we're experiencing um, things like the earth changes and the oil spill at this time, now we're being literally forced to, to respond and wake up. Can't avoid it anymore. Barbara Handclough, handclough2012.com. You can join Barbara and Jerry, her partner, and you can actually attend these workshops and it works. It has value. Her new book is her revised, I should say, Revised and Expanded Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, like all of Barbara's books, well worth reading. Somebody once said of her, Barbara Hanclough has a message that matters tremendously to every single person on this earth. It is about nothing less than achieving relationship with a brilliant and spiritually potent presence, Whitley Strieber. I feel that presence also, and I am just as uh, amazed about it as Barbara is, as she tries to cope with it with channeling and other things, and I try to cope with it by doing interviews with people who may be a little closer to it than I am. What an extraordinary time we in, we live in. Barbara, thank you so much for this wonderfully illuminating interview. Thank you, Whitley, and I always love talking to you, as you know. Yeah, we've got the kindred spirits. We're, Anne and I are going to have to come to one of your workshops. Is that we went through this monumental destructive event um, 11,500 years ago, and that we are currently a multi traumatized species. In other words, we've been a multi traumatized species for about 11,500 years, but we don't have any way of getting in touch. It would be like a person who was abused as a very small child, sexually abused or physically abused. 
but the person has no memory of the event, and so consequently they can't go after the originating problem, if you see what I mean. So that was the thesis of catastrophobia, and then of course I've gone on since then. I've taken that thesis, of course, and woven it into subsequent books and looking at it constantly from a different point of view. Yes, and you know, one of the most interesting things in Alchemy of Nine Dimensions, which is, by the way, a fascinating work we're going to be discussing over the course of this interview, is a mention in, uh, uh, on page uh, 101 of another planet quite similar to Earth in a nearby galaxy that hasn't mm-hmm. undergone such a catastrophe. And you discuss the difference between these two worlds. If you could illuminate us a little bit about Ion and how yeah. you came to know about Ion and what what this means in terms of our own future. Mm-hmm. Does that resonate with you, Whitley? Yes. The idea? Yeah, because usually you, you and I are somehow in connection with the same switching people. I could see what their potential was, and yet I could see that they were afflicted by severe blocks that were very difficult to break through. And so I went back to the original wisdom of my Cherokee grandfather, who was my teacher from age 3 to um, 17 when he died. And um, he always talked about this great cataclysm, and of course it exists in all of the ancient records of all of the um, the old people. Um, the fall of Atlantis is how we know about it in Greek background. And so my grandfather said that during my time, um, which of course is going on now, um, that the human race would have to wake up and remember what happened um, 11,500 years ago, which is this great cataclysm. And since writing Catastrophobia, I've modified the dates slightly in that it looks to me like this cataclysm actually stretched from about 14,000 B.C. to 9,500 B.C. But the big whammy, the big destructive force was definitely 9,500 B.C. That date is very, very correct. Um, What happened was fragments from the Vela supernova um, came into our solar system and wreaked havoc throughout our solar system for approximately three to 4,000 years, but most strongly 9500 BC. So to go back to my own research, I wrote the book with a couple of Oxford scientists, because I'm not a scientist myself. I'm a consciousness researcher. And my issue with these cataclysms is what have they done to human consciousness? And the thesis, the basic thesis of catastrophobia, sources of information often, um, that was purely channeled information. And as you know from my record, I don't channel very often, and I tend to test it to, to the nth degree, <laughs> because I don't trust I would rather get my information straight on when I'm fully conscious. But what what I channeled back in in, uh, 1995, um, which is in the Pleiadian agenda, is that there is another galaxy, a twin galaxy, to the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy, of course, is our galaxy. And our twin galaxy is Andromeda, which makes sense astronomically because Andromeda and the Milky Way galaxy are quite close, and they're also moving toward each other and merging. So, So all of this makes sense astronomically. But the channel part of it was that there is a planet in the Andromeda galaxy that's in a solar system very similar to our solar system. In other words, that planet is approximately the same distance uh, from its star, its sun. And that that planet um, has had a very similar history to Earth in terms of evolution in the galaxy, but that they did not suffer a cataclysm 11,500 years ago. And so that where does this channel information come from? Well, when I do channel, I channel from the Pleiades star system. And the beings who bring the information are the Pleiadians. And so the Pleiadian said that um, Ion has a, 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 like a vibrational resonance with us, our planet, and that Ion is holding a vibrational resonance. happy to have back with us a guest who has been with us on a number of occasions in the past and whose presence on Dreamland is getting more important every day for a particular reason. That is because Barbara Hand Clow has profound understanding of what is actually happening to our planet, where it is, and what to expect in the future. Barbara's been on us with us on Dreamland in uh, 2005, discussing the Pleiadian agenda. In 2007, she was here to discuss time acceleration. 
prior to the existence of our current archive, she discussed what I regard as one of the most important books written in modern times, Catastrophobia. Uh, we, she published in 2001, and we're going to begin today by discussing a little bit about that book, about why it is so important and about what it all means. Uh, Barbara's website is handcloud2012.com. Uh, she does workshops, and there are any number of ways of coming into connect, connection with herself and her partner, Jerry Clow. Uh, they have taught thousands of students worldwide how to navigate in a very special way. There are nine dimensions that we can navigate, and Barbara and I are going to be talking about those over the course of this interview. We need insight into understanding what is happening to us now. For example, we're going to be talking about the oil spill in a whole new way. Welcome to the show, Barbara Han Clow. Hi, Whitley. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And Barbara, before we take another step, I would like to return, if you don't mind, to catastrophobia because I thought it was so important. Could you tell us exactly well, first I would like to say that when this book was written in 2001, there was a smattering of information in the media and in, in the scientific press that there might have been a great catastrophe in uh, 11,500 years ago. Now, many years after the book has been written, Richard Firestone, Alan West, and Simon Warwick Smith have taken this into uh, a, a scientifically accepted reality. But Barbara Han Clow knew all about it long before then. Barbara, uh, could you tell us now what a, what Catastrophobia is about? Yeah, the reason that I wrote Catastrophobia is by the time 2000 rolled around, um, I'd been teaching for about 20 years at that point. And I, of course, teach higher consciousness techniques. And I, as I, the longer I taught, the more I was asking the same fundamental question, which is basically, what's wrong with us as a species? In other words, as I was 